heard, the Queen of Pop has arrived in the UK. She's in London to perform a new single on Top of the Pops, and she's been seen out and about all over town. For more than a decade, Madonna's maintained the status of pop icon. But now, the world's most recognizable woman says fame is not all it's cracked up to be. Very few people are equipped to live as an icon. Yes, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy's dog. <laughs> Greatest rock record ever. Audiences and fans. That record really meant a lot to me. What else could I do with this name? Right? Was what was I going to do? Be. Become a school teacher or something? <laughs> When she exploded onto the music scene with Like a Virgin back in 1984, few thought we would be recalling her name even a year later. And no one was predicting that she would sell 80 million records, head a company, and emerge as one of the most powerful figures in the entertainment industry. No one, that is, but Madonna. Back in 1983, while promoting her first record, Madonna told an interviewer her goal was to rule the world. Maybe she's fallen a bit short of that lofty objective, but she does command an empire that's landed her on the Forbes list of highest paid entertainers four years running. With her new record, Something to Remember, Madonna gives listeners a look back at her enduring career and adds a glimpse of what may be in store for her musical future. Something to Remember is a collection of a dozen ballads, nine previously released songs, and three new tracks. Billboard magazine called You'll See, the album's first single, a stunning effort. I think that my favorite songs that I've written of all the songs that I've written are my ballads, my slow songs. And actually for the past five years, different people have been coming to me and saying, you know, you should put a compilation record together of slow songs, and I finally did it. How did you choose which ballads would go onto this album? Just the ones I thought were, you know, that moved me the most, that stood the test of time that I could still bear to listen to over and over again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Reading through the lyrics of these ballads, it's notable to that me. I'm a manically depressed individual. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And is that true? Well, off and on. <laughs> Aren't you? Absolutely. Okay. Do you go to therapy for yours? <laughs> <laughs> um, not as much as I should. <clears throat> I think most creative people are manically depressed. And do you think that the creativity comes out of the depression somewhat? I think you have to dig deep. And I think that. Pain is, um, I think it's good to exercise your pain through your writing. Don't hold on to the past. Sometimes when I'm writing, I sort of have to dig into me past memories and a lot of really painful moments to come up with some poetic ideas and stuff. And so in doing that, you kind of go back, you just keep replaying all the sad moments in your life and kind of keeps you in a, a semi-permanent state of sadness. Do you find though that you prefer the songs that you've written when you when you are in that state to songs that you might have written when you were happy? Giddier. Yeah, definitely. While Madonna may be best known for her dance tracks, it's her ballads that showcase her songwriting and exploit the lower, sultry range of her voice, a voice that over time has matured. Critics are saying that with the new songs on Something to Remember, Madonna has delivered her most assured and full-bodied vocal performance to date. 
and that's music to the ears of a singer who would like to forget many of her early recordings. When I started singing, I didn't know what I was doing, and I wasn't really using my voice completely, and I never had any training, so um, I think over the years I've learned how to use it. It's interesting that people, I think, have focused more on your more dance-oriented music in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is going to maybe change the way people think of you as a singer? Um, well, I think it's going to change the emphasis. I mean, I think that people will um, pay more attention to the actual songs, which was one of the reasons I wanted to do it, because there's so always so much controversy surrounding everything that I do that I just wanted people to listen to the music and not get distracted by anything else. Since her earliest days, critics have had trouble seeing beyond the distraction. Somewhere behind all the controversy, Madonna's bigger-than-life persona, her fashion statements, her sexually explicit performances, and her outspokenness, the music was getting lost. And no sooner had her career begun than a cynical music industry started predicting a swift end to her career. How important was being a critical and commercial success to you early on? I don't think I ever was critically successful. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. If you took out the reviews of my work and things that I did and compare them to the, they're still saying the same thing. I've always had to deal with this, like, sense of, like, you know, people trying to sort of like um, predict that I would soon fail. And I've been dealing with that my entire career. When you hear that stuff, does that affect you anymore or does it just kind of... Yeah, it affects me because it makes me realize how miserable most human beings are and how instead of, you know, celebrating that someone could come from nothing and do something with their life, they have to um, try to tear you down because Ultimately, people don't want to be reminded of how little they've accomplished in their life. So, being a critical su success is not—it's not, it's not, not something important. that you look for, or would um, you? I. It's important to me because if it happened, it would mean to me that people would were, were finally paying attention to my work and not something that I represent to them. But, in the end. It's the people that you reach with your work that matters. So um, as long as, you know, people are buying my records or going to see my movies or whatever, then I, or coming to see my concerts, then that's all that matters, not what someone's written in a newspaper. Don't cry for me, Argentina. When we return to London, Madonna talks about playing the role of another controversial woman, Ava Perone. There are many people who think she's a saint, and then there are other people who think she was Satan herself. <laughs> so, and I can certainly identify with that. <laughs> Don't cry for me, Argentina. While in London, Madonna's main mission is to record the movie soundtrack to Evita for composer Andrew Lloyd Webber. Filming is scheduled to begin in January. The coveted role of Eva Perón, the determined seductress who became Argentina's first lady and most powerful political figure, has been bouncing around Hollywood for years. Since the idea for the movie first surfaced, Madonna was reported to be in the running. Then it was rumored Meryl Streep had landed the part, and then Michelle Pfeiffer was said to have a deal. But Madonna was passionate about playing Evita, and in the end, she got the job. It was meant to be mine, and everything happens for a reason. And um, when it came back around the third time, I said, OK, I'm supposed to be doing this movie. Because it was really hard for me to decide to do it, because I had to cancel doing a tour and, and a lot of things to promote my last album. And I had to give a lot of things up. And I thought, if it has come back to me the third time, it means I'm supposed to do it. What is it about her story that, uh, that's so appealing to you? I think that it's extremely unusual for a woman in a Latin country to have that kind of power, the kind of power that she did have. I mean, women, well, let's face it, you know, <laughs> we, don't, we won't go into that. But I mean, <laughs> she was more powerful than her husband. And Latin countries are 
traditionally incredibly chauvinistic. So that in itself is interesting to me. But what she achieved is incredibly interesting because she came from nothing. And she managed to go from nothing to this incredibly powerful woman who had such an influence on her country and world politics too. And that is such an amazing story, I think. And, um, and also the controversy because you either, if you know anything about her, you either hate her or, or you love her. And if you go to Argentina, you'll get really extreme reactions. And I love that. And, and there are many people who think she's a saint. And then there are other people who think she was um, Satan herself. <laughs> so, and I can certainly identify with that. <laughs> you can relate to yeah. it. When you're uh, working in a film, uh, obviously, the director in that case is the one with the overall vision that, mm -hmm. that you were part of. Is that does that feel odd to you to not be the one with the final say? Yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Is it is you it? You have to be very submissive to be an actor or an actress. Um, and um, in it, it's frustrating in that no matter what you do, someone else. It's someone else's vision, and and someone else decides ultimately what what is left, and and they can completely shape or destroy your performance. Um, therefore, it is a very good reason to only work with people that you really, really trust. Um, and I have certainly learned that through several mistakes, but that's how you learn. In some ways, is it a relief to not be the the final say and not be the one in control? No. No. <laughs> you prefer to be in control. It's not about preferring to be in control. It's just that I'm so used to, in my work, having a vision or a dream and, you know, choosing things and, and you know, saying, you know, that's, that's great and that's great and let's do this and let's do that. And it's really hard for me. I mean, it's not so hard that I'm, like, you know, gritting my teeth or something. It's just, it's just unusual to, to, like, go, oh, I'm not in that decision-making process. Oh, I have no say in that, and, you know, so um, it's frustrating. Madonna returns to theaters Christmas Day as the glamorous witch Elizabeth in the new film Four Rooms. It's her 13th feature film role. But unlike the success she's enjoyed with music, Madonna has yet to truly make it on the big screen. <coughs> Thank you. Critics seem to agree that she has not found an effective film role since Desperately Seeking Susan in 1985. And many have written that if Evita fails, Madonna can say goodbye to Hollywood. Realistically, how, how much do you feel you have at stake with this movie? Do you even think in those terms? Absolutely. Mm. It's very important that the movie does well, but if it doesn't, I know that I'll go on and find other things to do. I guess you've always known if she is anything, Madonna is a survivor. Few performers who arrived in the 80s carried a faithful following into the 90s. But with street smarts and strong business instincts, she's weathered the highs and the lows of an unforgiving industry. For nearly 15 years, Madonna's been a pioneer, opening doors for female artists who, until she came along, were given little room to test the boundaries of mainstream pop. Unlike so many of her contemporaries who seem hell-bent on self-destruction, Madonna appears nearly indestructible. Little girl, don't run away so fast. I think you forgot to kiss, kiss her goodbye. When she was just six years old, her mother died. That loss, more than any other event, shaped who Madonna would become. Do you think there was something in that experience that, that drove you to be able to do a lot of what you've done? Absolutely. In what way? Do you think it gave you some, a certain strength at a very young age? Or? Well, I think after destroying me emotionally, then it, it sort of, I sort of went the other way, which was to say, OK, um, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to never rely on anybody, so I won't be hurt that way again. And so it made me incredibly independent. 
And I didn't grow up with any sort of female role model to sort of give me an idea of how I should behave. So I was actually quite fearless. I don't think I would have gone to New York when I was 17 and not known anybody and just said, you know, really followed my dream. Maybe I would have chosen something different. Dad, I'd love it if you'd come to both shows. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's pretty racy in some sections. I don't know if you could take it two nights in a row. Oh, geez, I had to get racy on me. Dad, I'm not getting racy. I've been racy. I know. Were there things that your father did as well that you, what, that you, you? felt um, contributed to the drive that you have? He had a very good work ethic, and I think that influenced me. I mean, he was... I mean, I suppose some people would consider him a fascist. Maybe <laughs> the way he raised us is something like, you will do this because I said so, and you don't need any reason. And um, I mean, he was... He, he disciplined us, and at the time, you know, I hated him for it, but in retrospect, I think it was really great for me because he really raised me to believe that I would only get something if I worked really hard for it. Dad, you don't understand the And he gave us incentive to get good grades in schools and stuff. I got a quarter for every A I got on my report card, so that was good. So, of course, I had to collect the most amount of qu quarters when I came home from school with my report card. <clears throat> there was a lot of competition in my family for quarters. It was the only time we got money from, from my father, so. Did you always, back then, did you always get the most quarters? Yes, I did. <laughs> and today? Yes, I you do. You are still getting the most quarters. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. But do you want to have kids of your own? Yes. Do you, do you want them soon? Yes, tomorrow. Really? Yes. Do you want to have more than one? I don't know. Two or three. Do you, do you want to have a marriage along with that, or is that not That really? would be really nice. You'd prefer that? Of course. Do you... So, how's the weather? <laughs> For a woman who has played out so much of her personal life in public, Madonna is quick to change the subject if she suspects the next question concerns her love life. Just as quickly, however, she'll tackle more serious topics head on. In terms of having kids, would you raise your kids with religion? Yes. As sexist and patriarchal, you know, as Catholicism is, I, th I think it still had a, a good effect on me in, in many ways. and. It made me ask a lot of questions, so, and, and I think rituals, I mean the discipline of going to church and rituals, things like that are good for people, whether you end up doing it later on in your life or not, still it's good. How would you talk to your own kids about, about sex? Well, very honestly. From day one? Absolutely. Just... Yeah. Because ultimately they're going to get some wrong information from somebody else before I get to them and that's really stupid to wait. I mean, chil people think that children don't pay attention to things when they're five. They, they see and hear everything. Do you subscribe to the theory that everybody is born bisexual, or do you think that sexuality is something that's, that's learned? I don't have the answer to that. I'm no. in the dark there. I have another one on that But same. I think whatever it is, you know, that we should always, that we should embrace it. And, and, never make ourselves or other people feel ashamed, whatever it is. Why do you think that everyone seems to love speculating about uh, two women having sex, but the idea of two men having sex is still such an abhorrent idea to so many people? Um, well, I think it's mostly abhorrent to straight men who are afraid of their own homosexuality. Um, I don't think it really grosses out any women, not any women I know. And I think that two men having sex is erotic. When we come back to our interview in England, Madonna takes one final shot. Well, when I'm dead, they'll finally kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how it works? Madonna has always surprised, and true to form, the girl who once said she wanted to rule the world has some surprising answers when questioned about what's important in life and what's not. At the age of 37, her priorities are changing. Very few people are equipped to live as an icon. Yes, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy's dog. <laughs> and yet you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's too late now. Too late I can't to back, back out of it now. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't really want to, though, would you? Well... No, I guess not. 
when we were kids, my, my brothers and sisters and I used to play this game where you had to rank the following in order of importance to you. Fame, money, power, and love. Mm -hmm. Which order do you think that you would love. put those in? Love first. Absolutely love. Um, money. Mm -hmm. And if you have love and you have money, then you have power and fame is not important. So, For more than 10 years now, you've uh, accumulated incredible fame and wealth and become one of the world's most recognizable women. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that you would have uh, traded all of that for? Yes. What is that? A mother. <laughs> Throughout her long career, she has remained unpredictable. Even in death, Madonna plans on having the last laugh. Well, when I'm dead, they'll finally kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how it works? <laughs> when Marilyn Monroe was alive, they were so vicious and cruel to her. They ripped her to shreds. They wouldn't give it up to her in any way, shape, or form. And then when she died, it's just like, oh, she's a comedic genius. I mean, excuse me. I mean, they do that to everybody. They did it to Vincent van Gogh. They, they, I mean, it's, history just repeats itself over and over again that way.